you can start. Okay, thank you very much. So, <coughs> we are talking about cubic fields and quartic fields, and now let us come to, to quintic fields. Now, this example will show the possible difficulties at, at solving such Diophantine problems. <coughs> so, Xi is going to be a algebraic, a quintic algebraic integer, so an algebraic integer of degree 5, and k is going to be the number field generated by Xi over Q. So for for cubic number fields, the index form equation is a cubic 2e equation in two variables. For quartic number fields, the index form equation has three variables and degree 6. In the quintic case, the index form equation has four variables and degree 10. So the degree of the equation uh, increases very fast. So it is n times n minus 1 over 2 for a degree n number field. So also in, in, in this case, we, we represent the algebraic integers alpha in the number field k in, in the similar form with, with rational integer coefficients x1, x2 up to x5 and with a common rational integer denominator d. Well, as, as you see, the problem is more difficult if the number field is, is totally real because the, the difficulty of the problem highly depends on the unit rank of the number field. So, as usually, we are looking for generators of power integral basis, that is, uh, for algebraic integers alpha of index 1. We can calculate this way the index of uh, alpha. And the advantage of this representation is that if we uh, divide by the index of xi, then these differences of the conjugates of alpha will be divisible by the differences of the conjugates of xi. That's why this, this representation is, is useful. So after, after dividing by these differences, the, <coughs> the factors of that discriminant can be written as a linear polynomial with coefficients x2, x3, x4. Of course, x1 fails out and x5. And the interesting thing about it is that actually if, if you consider this number delta ij that it depends on, on two conjugates of xi. And if the number field k is generated by xi, it is a quintic number field, then the number field containing two conjugates of xi will be of degree 20, 5 times 4. But <coughs> fortunately, these coefficients only depend on the sum and the product of these two conjugates of, of xi. And in the most difficult cases, when the number field, the quintic number field is totally real, then uh, the these Galois groups are doubly transitive, which, which implies that the number field containing the sum and product of two conjugates of xi is a proper subfield of the number field generated by the two distinct conjugates of xi. So this, this number field is of degree 20, but any subfield of it is only of degree 10. And this is, this is our luck, because for this reason, 
it will be sufficient for us to work in, in these number fields of degree 10, which will still have in the total area case nine fundamental units, which is still manageable. But for a degree 20 number fields, number field, the, the unit rank may be up to 19. You will see that that is too high for these computations. <coughs> Actually, for, for solving index form equations in degree 5 and degree 6 number fields, that was the idea of jury, because these are, uh, Professor Al Fadil, you know that these are joint papers with, with jury. Uh, this was his, his, his single idea, which was, which was anyway very important, but otherwise the computation was, 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 was done by me, and it, it took quite a long work. So these delta, the product of these delta, are, that is the discriminant, so that is that is a complete norm. So these delta are algebraic integers of, of given norm. So they can be written as an algebraic integer of one of those finitely many non-associated algebraic integers which have that given norm and, and a unit, which unit can be written as a power product of the fundamental units of the nine fundamental units in the number field of degree 10. So we are considering now the most difficult case when the number field is totally real and when the unit rank is the largest, when the unit rank is equal to 9. And we follow that method which I was describing yesterday for solving unit equations. So instead of the variables x2 up to x4, now in the following we shall have the variables a1 up to a9, which are the exponents of the fundamental units in this representation. And capital A is going to denote the maximum absolute values of, of these exponents. As I have explained to you, the, uh, this uh, so-called Ziegler's identity always holds for the differences of the conjugates of, of any algebraic integer alpha. So the index form equation can always be represented as a, as a, as a unit equation. This beta is well, the quotient of two differences of conjugates. These differences of conjugates can be written as a fixed algebraic number and a power product of the fundamental units. So both of these B betas can be written as the product of some fixed algebraic number and a pro power product of these quotients of fundamental units. And, and we have these unknown exponents a1 and up to a9. So we have no other choice than to solve this so-called unit equation in the number field of degree 10. So, and in general, we have this representation of, of the unit equation. So two terms having some equal to one, and both terms are equal to a fixed algebraic number and a power product of, of certain fixed algebraic integers. Now, I have mentioned yesterday that you can apply Baker's method to solving these unit equations. The Baker's method gives the bound 
why I am speaking about an, an explicit example, which I, I shall show you later on. The upper bound for these exponents obtained by Baker's method is 10 to the 83, which can be reduced by using that general reduction method for several variables. It can be reduced to 204. <coughs> so all exponents much must be less than in absolute value they must be less than 204. We have altogether nine possible exponents. So this is the number of possible tuples of exponents a1 up to a9. And this this is this is the the problem because so to to any unit equation you can apply Baker's method that can be done. The reduction method by using this LLR reduction algorithm that is also fast even for, for several variables. <coughs> and we can be lucky that the, the final reduced bound is, is not very large, 204. But still we have a couple of unknown variables, nine variables. The number of possible tuples of, of the variables is a huge number. So it, it is not possible to test all these tuples of possible values of the variables within our life or within 100 years. Or so actually, if, if, we, if you want to test numerically <coughs> some condition concerning some Diophantine equation, then to test about a million of possible cases, it takes almost a day or half a day. So this is hopeless. <coughs> Therefore, to solve similar problems, in addition to, to Baker's method and reduction method, we have to invest so-called enumeration methods so somehow we have to deal with this, this number of, of possible cases. And the, this numerical method <coughs> was first applied by Klaus Wildanger, who was a PhD student of, of Michael Post in, in the 1990s. And then this enumeration method was made a little bit sharper by Michael Post and myself in, in 2001 to, to solve non-form equations and, we, we were, and, and to solve relative to equations. And that method was, was applicable also, also <coughs> in this case. As, as I have shown you <coughs> yesterday, let me come back. I apologize. Here. So the <coughs> essence of this method in the two variable case is that if, if we have a bound for the variables, let's say two variables, then <coughs> all possible pairs of the variables are located <coughs> in, in this square. But using the original unit equation, it can be shown that these possible pairs of the variables cannot be present anywhere in this square, but they can be covered by such thin ellipsoids. And these thin ellipsoids may contain only a, a few or not very large number of possible points. And this way, it is possible to diminish the number of possible cases to enumerate considerably. So th that, that is the essence of this enumeration method, which I would like to uh, show you on this example. <coughs> so in, in general, we are considering unit equations of this shape, where these 
i, these are certain multi-indices, in our case i, j, k, so they are triples of integers, and they are of this shape, a product of a fixed algebraic integer and a power product of certain other fixed algebraic integers, and, and the exponents are unknown. And to apply this method, we have to assume that we have sufficiently many such multi-indices, such that if some multi-index, such as ijk, is present, then there are two other multi-indices uh, representing the corresponding numbers, and also uh, the, the set of selected multi-indices. So to, to apply this method from the possible set of multi-indices, we, we make a small selection, but this small selection must contain sufficiently many uh, multi-indices so that uh, these corresponding multi-indices are also contained and uh, such that the these vectors must be linearly independent. So shortly, there must be sufficiently many indices in, in this set. And then, instead of the original uh, beta, we take logarithms, and then the logarithm of beta is equal to logarithm of tau, plus a linear combination of these exponents a, and the logarithms of the new. These are collected in, in these vectors. So this vector b is the sum of, of uh, b, b is, b is the vector containing the conjugates of the betas, and b is equal to g plus a linear combination of these vectors, a, what we, what we had here, with coefficients a1 and so on, an. And now, using the Baker type bound, the reduced upper bound, which was 204 for us, we can give an upper bound S0 for the absolute values, a lower and upper bound for the absolute values of these uh, betas with all multi indices contained in this set. So instead of instead of the maximum of the absolute values of the exponents, we are now working with a, an, an, an upper bound which is valid for the maximum and for the minimum of the conjugates of these these betas. And it is it is obvious. It, it's it's really not. It's it's really easy that if we have a smaller bound for a, then we have a smaller value for s naught. And if we can diminish s naught, then we shall have a smaller value for the maximum of these these exponents. And the idea behind this enumeration method is to diminish this large value s to smaller values, small s, in, in several steps. This lemma seems to be very complicated, but the proof is, in fact, very easy. Just I apologize, the notation is complicated. So we can diminish this capital S to a smaller value, small s. So if this estimate is valid for all Marty indices, then Either the similar estimates are valid with small s for all multi indices, or there exists an exceptional multi index satisfying this inequality. So, in order to diminish this capital S to small s, we have to consider the <coughs> exceptional cases which do not satisfy these inequalities, in which cases the inequalities with capital S are valid, and this inequality also holds. 
So we have to enumerate all possible uh, vectors of the variables satisfying these inequalities. And as you will see, these inequalities imply such a thin ellipsoid, which we shall enumerate later on. And the possible integer points in these ellipsoids will be much less than that huge number of all possible uh, vectors of the variables that we were cal calculating at the beginning. Now we assign weights to the coordinates of those vectors. This is a small weight because s is a large number. 1 over logarithm of s is a small number. Small s is, is not very small, but s minus 1 over s minus 2 is close to 1. So the logarithm is close to 0. Therefore, 1 over this logarithm will be a, a large number. So we assign a small weight to almost all, all coordinates, with the exception of that coordinate where we assign a large weight. And then we multiply the coordinates of our vectors by these weights. And using the uh, inequalities for the logarithms of absolute values of the betas, we, we can prove that the square of the norm of these linear forms will be less than t. t is the number of, of possible multi-indices in the selected set. And, and these, this inequality defines uh, an ellipsoid. And since we had, at one coordinate, we had a large weight, this ellipsoid has a very small extension in that direction. It, it may only have large extensions in the other directions. So this is a this is a t-dimensional ellipsoid in the t-dimensional uh, real space, which is flat, which is thin. It in one direction it it does not have too large extension. And to enumerate the integer points of such ellipsoids, we can use uh, a well-known, a relatively well-known method of, of think and post, which was developed uh, a couple of years, years before. Now, I apologize, it, it, it was very complicated, but let, let me give you an impression about this method by, by giving an explicit example. So, consider this quintic number field generated by Xi with this defining polynomial. It is a totally real quintic number field with Galois group S5. It already has a, a, a power integral basis, so the root generates a power integral basis. Solving the index form equation, we can answer the question whether or not there exist further in equivalent generators of power integral basis in that quintic number field. Uh, as I have mentioned to you, instead of a degree 20 number field containing two distinct conjugates of Xi, we only have to work in a degree 10 number field, which contains the sum and the product of two distinct number, two distinct conjugates of psi. And this degree 10 number field is generated by a root of this polynomial. In this degree 10 number field, we have this uh, integral basis. So this is the point where using these uh, algebraic number theory packages, we can still calculate the integral basis but to calculate the fundamental units, it might already be quite difficult. Now, <clears throat> as I have mentioned, Baker's method gives the bound 10 to the 82. And this bound is reduced to, well, in this, in this example, 133. In 
in five steps. To use that reduction method, you remember that we use this cap large number age, which, which is about the bound raised to the degree of the number field. So calculating with such large numbers, we have to use very high accuracy. In this case, we were using 1,300 digits uh, precision in, in MAPLE program. Now, after reducing the bound, uh, we were selecting a suitable set of multi indices KJI. And so this, this, uh, the total computation time for the reduction was, was about 10 hours. Then we were selecting this set of multi indices containing 15, 15 uh, set of indices. And our purpose was to use this enumeration method for this set of multi indices. Now the interesting table is the following. Using the reduced upper bound 133, we had to start with this value of capital S. And this value of capital S was reduced in, in 11 steps to smaller values. And in each case, we had to enumerate that many possible uh, vectors of A1 up to A9. So this is, this is almost 2 million cases. But but this is, uh, this is doable. And testing all these uh, vectors, first we used uh, a sieve to throw out a large number of possible vectors. And then uh, there were only much less uh, possible vectors, which we had to substitute into the original unit equation to test whether or not they correspond to solutions. So finally, the, there were quite a lot of distinct generators of power integral basis in this field. This 1, 0, 0, 0, this corresponds to the original xi, which is the root of the quintic polynomial. But using this uh, Baker's method, reduction method, and enumeration method, we could finally solve this index form equation in this quintic number field. And we have found quite a lot of, actually surprisingly, a lot of, of distinct generators of power integral basis. Now, and this, this method, we were trying to execute also for degree six number fields. Well, after having the, the joint paper with jury for the degree five case, he gave us the idea that let's, let's try it for degree six. For degree six, you already have five variables, and the index form equation has degree 30. Using this idea about the doubly transitivity of the totally real number fields, we had to work in a number field of degree 15, <coughs> which may have, in the totally real case, up to 19, up to 14 fundamental units. So for degree 5, the number field is of degree 10, with up to 9 fundamental units. For degree 6, the number field in which we had to work is of degree 15 up to 14 fundamental units. And that took very, very long. So for, for degree 5, the total computation time was about 8, 10, 12 hours. But for degree 6, it took four months. Of course, it was running parallelly on a, on a supercomputer on, on 10 or 20 
uh, processors and so uh, the real time was about one week but but the total am amount of, of computation time was about four months this implies that it is impossible so uh, this is the case when we have to turn to something else to have to we have to find more efficient methods and so on so it, it has turned out that that this direct application of reducing the index form equation to this type of unity equations, it, 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 it does not work. So how to overcome this difficulty? So that was the time when, when the first edition of my book has, has appeared. So how to construct much faster algorithms? So we were considering special types of higher degree number fields, composites of number fields. We were trying the, to reduce the index form equation to certain relative index, relative to equations. And, and in some cases, we were using the fact that the index form factorizes into, into several factors. So instead of one complicated equation, we, we had to consider a system of more simple equations. For example, in case of sextic fields, which contain a quadratic subfield, <coughs> so let us assume that M is a quadratic subfield of the number field of degree 6 with integral basis 1 and omega, and assume that the sextic field K is generated by theta having this relative cubic defining polynomial over the intermediate field M. And in, in almost all these cases, so in 99% of the cases, then in this case the number field of degree 6 has such an integral basis consisting of 1 theta theta squared omega omega theta omega theta squared and then any algebraic integer alpha can be written as a linear combination of these basis elements with, with rational integer coefficients and our purpose is to find these rational integer coefficients. Now here this rho is going to be minus theta 1 minus theta 2 <coughs> where these theta 1 and theta 2 are two relative conjugates of, of the relative cubic algebraic integer theta, which, which will appear here. So actually, in this case, it turns out that the index form factorizes into two factors, and one of the factors is a relative cubic 2 equation over the intermediate field, where capital X is x2 plus omega y2, capital Y is x3 plus omega y3, which means that algebraic integers in the intermediate field M, and the variables of this relative cubic 2 equation are x and y. This new is a, is a unit in the intermediate field M. So similarly to two equations, there exist quite efficient methods for solving such uh, relative two equations. And if on the right hand side you have a, an unknown unit nu, then the equation makes it possible to find all possible x and y up to a unit factor. Up to a unit factor. And the second factor of the, the equation is a, a polynomial equation of degree 9 in, in, in these variables x to x3, y to y3, and here y1 also, also appears. So the, the total degree of the index form equation for the degree 6 number field is 15. Out of the 15, we have a degree 6 in this relative 2 equation. So this is of degree 3, but the norm of it is of degree 6. And the remaining 9 degrees 
are contained in, in this polynomial equation. So this was the first idea to overcome those terrible difficulties to solve index form equations in, in general sextic number fields. And since here we have a, a, a relative two equation, this idea, anyway, this, this statement made it possible to solve the index form equation in, in several types of, of sextic number fields having a quadratic subfield. This idea led us to consider relative extensions and, and relative indices. As I have mentioned at the beginning of my talk, if there is an intermediate field M, then the index of any algebraic integer can be factorized. And this first factor, this is what, what we call the relative index of alpha. So alpha is a number field. Al alpha is a algebraic integer in the number field K. M is an intermediate field. And this, this is the relative index of alpha with respect to this intermediate field M. And of course, the index has a second factor. And the index is equal to 1 if and only if both of these indices are equal to 1. So there are some consequences of, of this statement. But the most important thing is that to calculate elements of index 1, we can split into two parts. First, we can determine all integers of relative index 1. So solving the first factor of the index form equation. So first, we determine all betas with relative indices 1, and then all possible generators alpha of absolute index 1 will be of this shape. So an algebraic integer a in m plus a unit times beta. So in the next step, after having determined all possible generators of relative power integral basis, in, in the next step from the second equation from the second factor of the index, we have to determine A and the unit epsilon. So this way we can split one complicated problem into two somewhat more simple problems. To give, to give you an example, let us consider imaginary quadratic number fields M generated by the square root of minus d. And let us, well, let us again consider the simplest cubic number fields. And if this number is square free and if the discriminants are co-prime, then this uh, number field has, has such an integral basis. And using that integral basis, the first factor, the relative index implies a relative cubic 2 equation. Actually, this is the, the simplest relative 2 equation. So the relative analog or generalization of the original simplest family of uh, cubic 2 equations, which have already been solved by Clemens Heiberger a couple of years before. So uh, Clemens Heiberger has determined all possible quadratic integers y1 and y2, which are solutions of this equation with an unknown unit on the right hand side, which means that all possible generators of relative power integral basis are of this shape, x1 plus a unit times x2 alpha plus x3 alpha squared, where x2 and x3 are solutions of, of this relative 2 equation. But then 
we still have to determine y1 and everything in a parametric form depends on d and a. d was the parameter of the quadratic number field and a was the parameter of the uh, simplest cubic number field. And it has turned out, that this is a joint result with my PhD student Laszlo Remata, that generators of power integral basis exist only for Gaussian integers when d is equal to 1. And in, in those cases, this, this is the list of all possible values of a, y1, and x to x3, which, from which we can construct all possible generators of power integral basis in, in our sextic field, which is the cubic extension of the imaginary quadratic fields using the uh, simplest cubic number fields. This is an, an other example, which perhaps I shall skip now. A, a more lucky situation is that we do not only have a relative extension, but we have the composite of two number fields where the, and this was actually the case also in the previous example, where the product of the subfield has full degree, which is equal to the product of the degrees of the subfields. So assume that capital L is a number field of degree small l, and capital M is a number field of degree small m. And the composite field K, we assume that the composite field K, which is the product of these subfields, we assume that this composite field K has degree L times M. In this field, well, in this case, this number field K has two subfields. So using the relative extensions, the indices of the algebraic integers can be factorized in, in two different ways. But in fact, the index has, in this case, three different factors. And if we have more factors, then it makes our job easier, because instead of one complicated problem, we have three somewhat more simple problems to solve. So these are the relative indices of alpha with respect to the subfields. And this is a third factor. But in order to have an algebraic integer alpha of index 1, all these indices, which are, of course, rational integers, they have to be equal to 1. Actually, the, the relative indices can be explicitly formulated as Diophantine equations. And this is one of my favorite theorems, because here we can explicitly describe those Diophantine equations, which are equivalent to the relative indices equal to 1. So if, if the number field L has an integral basis 1, L2, and so on, LR, and I sub L is the index form corresponding to that integral basis of the number field L, and similarly, Assume that the number field M has an integral basis 1, M2, and so on, MS. And I sub M is the index form corresponding to this integral basis of the number field M. Then, if we assume, as formerly, that the discriminants of the fields are co-prime, then the composite field has an integral basis Li times Mj. And so any alpha can be written as a linear combination of these integral basis elements with unknown coefficients Xij. Now, the conditions that the relative indices are equal to 1 are exactly equivalent to these Diophantine equations in which 
the, the substitute algebraic integers from the number field M into the index form equation of the number field L and we take the norm M over Q. This has to be equal to plus or minus 1 and vice versa for the other case we substitute algebraic integers of the number field L into the index form equation corresponding to the number field M and we take norm L over Q and this has to be equal to 1. So actually this is the explicit version of the condition that the relative indices has to be equal to 1. In, in case when we have one of the fields as a cubic number field, then the corresponding equation is a cubic relative to equation, which, which we can solve. And in addition to these two equations describing the relative indices, we do not forget that there is also a third factor of the index and all the three factors has to be equal to one. To make things easier and more understandable, let us come back to the ground and let us let me let me give you an, an explicit example. So assume that we take again the imaginary quadratic number fields M and we compose them with a with totally real cubic number fields L. So we take the composition of imaginary quadratic fields and totally real cubic number fields and we assume that the discriminants are co-prime and we take this integral basis and we are looking for uh, generators of power integral basis in this ring. Actually, if the discriminants are co-prime, then uh, this ring is just the ring of integers of the sextic number field. And in that case, 1 theta theta squared is an integral basis of L. Where the interesting thing about it, and which gives the reason why we were choosing imaginary quadratic fields and totally real cubic number fields is that in this case the three factors of the index form of the composite sextic number field are the following three factors. So any algebraic integer alpha in this ring can be written as a linear combination of the basis elements and this, this can be written as a linear combination of 1 theta theta squared with quadratic coefficients x1, x2, x3 where xj is capital XJ is the quadratic algebraic integer small xj plus omega times y small yj. So these are the three factors of the of the index form equation. So the first factor is a cubic relative to equation which we have a chance to, to solve. The second factor is a simple norm equation corresponding to the cubic number field and, and there is a, a, a third factor because the index has three factors. Now the interesting thing about it is that in this case when we have the composite of imaginary quadratic fields and totally real cubic fields, the, the first factor implies two other equations and, and oh sorry. And these equations can simply be obtained by separating the real and imaginary parts of the factors of the, of the equation. 
so let us consider the more, more simple case when minus d is congruent to 2 or 3 modulo 4, then the integral basis of the imaginary quadratic field is, is 1 and i times the square root of d. Then this relative 2e cubic 2e equation implies the pair of these equations. And here, the first equation, that is exactly a cubic 2e equation. This is actually the index form equation in the cubic number field. That one we can solve. And the corresponding equation here on the right hand side, if d is not equal to 1, then the right hand side is smaller than 1, which implies that here this rational integer can only be equal to 0. So this second equation implies that y2 and y3 has to be equal to 0. So we can determine in this well, very lucky case, but well, you see that these problems are, are always very complicated, so uh, we are happy when, when we find a case in which we can solve the index form equation. So this way we were finding this case when, when our sextic number field is the composite of imaginary quadratic fields and totally real cubic number fields. And in, in that case, the first factor of the index implies these two equations. The first one is the original index form equation corresponding to the total area cubic number field. This is a cubic 2 equation. We can solve it. And the second equation implies that y2 and y3 both have to be equal to 0. And from that, if y2 and y3 are equal to 0, then the second equation implies that y1 has to be equal to plus or minus 1. So in this case, we can completely solve the, we can completely solve the index equation. Let, let me give you a, an example. So this uh, totally real family of cubic number fields was investigated by uh, Bennett and Gader Marci. And in this infinite parametric family of totally real cubic number fields, they have explicitly determined all generators of power integral basis. And we, we were composing these totally real cubic number fields with imaginary quadratic number fields generated by the square root of minus d, assuming that uh, minus d is congruent to 2 or 3 modulo 4. And in this composite number field k generated by root theta t of this polynomial and i times square root of d, we were this, uh, investigating the possible generators of power integral basis in, in this ring, which is very often equal to the ring of integers of this sextic number field. And using the previous result, we could uh, prove that this, this ring is, is never monogenic. So there exist no generators of power integral basis at all. Do I have five minutes or ten minutes? Eight or ten. Eight or ten. So let me mention that the same idea can be used also in a somewhat more general situation when we consider the composite of imaginary quadratic fields and any totally real number fields L. So assume that psi is a totally real algebraic integer, so all conjugates are real, 
generating the number field L with this integral basis 1 L to n zone L n and denote by I sub L the corresponding index form. And then let us compose this totally real number field L of degree n by imaginary quadratic number fields m having the integral basis 1 and omega where omega is i times square root of d. And we consider the composite of these number fields assuming that the discriminants are co-prime. In this case of composite fields the index form again has three factors and the first factor the first factor again implies absolute equations with rational integer coefficients so that that first factor of the index form equation actually this is the relative index over the subfield L I assume it implies this pair of uh, equations where the first one is actually the original index form equation in the totally real number field L and the second one implies that all these variables have to be equal to zero and if these variables y2 and so on y n are equal to zero then the second equation implies that y1 is, has to be equal to plus or minus one which means that all generators of power integral basis in the composite field K can be obtained from the solutions of the index form equation in the number field L and using these variables which implies that all generators of power integral basis in the number field K has to be of this shape where beta is a generator of a power integral basis in the number field L, x is an arbitrary rational integer and we have plus or minus omega where omega is the integral basis element in the imaginary quadratic number field. I, I do not want to go into details but the proof only depends on separating the real and imaginary parts of the factors of the index and separating using these inequalities we obtain the the equations which which appear in 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 this statement so uh, i apologize for being a relatively complicated in the second part of the equation maybe during the conference i shall have another talk in which i will try to make all these things somewhat more clear. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> so are there questions? Are there any questions? It means that it was far too complicated everything. So sorry about it, but well after having the cubic and quotic case, which was relatively which had a relatively easy structure. This printed case has shown what are the difficulties, what, what kind of difficulties may arise, arrive. So, reducing the index form equation in any number of fields, if the degree is high, then the only known method is, is to reduce the index equation to such a unit equation. This method was used also by, by Birch and Merriman and by Jury to prove that there are only finitely many solutions and the upper bound for the solutions of the index equation. But also when you want to calculate the solutions of the index form equation, for the moment, we have no other method. And if we reduce the index equation to this unit equation, then the problem is that we have to work on a number field of high degree. 
that if we have such a number field of what we give 10 or 15, then several difficulties will, will arrive, arise. So we can we can apply Baker's method to give up amounts, we can reduce these uh, bounds by using this LLR reduction algorithm. They work also in high degree number fields, but afterwards, after having the reduced bound, the number of possible cases is, is too large to test them directly, and then we have to use this very complicated enumeration method, which takes also a huge number, a, a very, very long uh, computation time. So, therefore, for, for quintic number fields, to solve such an equation, of course, we took a, a quintic number field with very small discriminant and the declining polynomial had, had small coefficients. But even then, the computation time took about 10 or 12 hours. And in the DT6 case, it took four months. So that is, that is already after the limit that uh, we can call doable. So, and this means that for, for higher degree number fields, we, for the moment, we can only consider special cases when, when the number field has some subfields or when the number field is, is a composite of some subfields in order to have several factors of the index form. And then, then we have the chance to, to reduce that complicated problem to, to some more simple problems which we can perhaps do with. So this is the present state of the of this area. So I apologize for being so complicated. I know. Thank you very much. Really the, the talk was very interesting and, and uh, attractive. In fact, uh, I'm wondering is there any other methods that, which is based not uh, the method that you exposed here? Always we need to start from the polynomial, the defined, uh, the defined yes. polynomial. Can we study the monogeneity using, for example, ramification and uh, other arithmetical properties of the field? Far off the polynomial, which guides us to study some, uh, some uh, different equations. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, for example, the Newton polygon method, which is very often used by Professor Hussein and that uses a completely other construction that is uh, applicable to prove monogeneity or non-monogeneity. But, but, and that is that is very efficient also for high degree number fields and high degree true number fields and number fields generated by synonyms and so on. And recently there were several wonderful results obtained for monogeneity of number fields by using the Newton polygon method. But if you do not only want to prove that the number field is monogenic or not monogenic, but you, you want to have in your hands all possible generators of power integral basis. Then, up to our knowledge, today we have no other method than solving these different equations. So it is, it is completely different to prove that the number field is monogenic or not monogenic, or to determine more possible generators of power. I'm the first question to I think I may I may not understand the is this, do you need why to to guarantee the, to test the monogenicity? Yes, yes. Is it to solve the 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 question. Yeah, that, 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 that might be very complicated. Yeah. So even even if finally it turns out that there are no generators of power into time still we have to solve these equations and finally we find that there are no solutions. Then the number of is not going to be. Just uh, a very important uh, that I know from you, but uh, your uh, your technique with the uh, comp composite fields and uh, which allows to factorize the index mm -hmm. form. 
you know, you know that the problem of solving the equation of high degree is the factorization. If we have some factorization, that uh, the problem is very is more easier than the, the, the previous one. It is known for uh, all equations uh, in, in polynomials. The second why the technique used by uh, the team of Nakahara. The, every time to show that the the field is not monogenic, they try to choose some uh, intermediate field, and the, because the, the the field, the top field over the intermediate is not monogenic, uh, relative extension, yes. they conclude that uh, the field cannot be monogenic. It's thanks to, to your formula, because we have two factors. If one factor that doesn't have no solution, so don't try with the other factors. This this one is unsolvable, so uh, you yes. guarantee that guarantee the non-homogeneity of the top extensions. Yes. Yes. So these these factors uh, correspond to to the generators of relative power integrals. Yes, is exactly. If, if, if there exists a generator of absolute power integral basis, then this number will also have relative indices one. Yeah. Uh, yes, this technique is used by Nakahara and his team, and yes. never, I, I cannot understand what they did until this uh, formula. If, if there are no algebraic integers with relative index one, yes, then yes. There that don't be try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Algebraic integers with absolute index one. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Exactly. But they, they, their calculation is always very complicated. Yes, uh, sure. Okay, thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you. See you all tomorrow in the company. Yes, sure. Let us to keep a photo with you. Het gelaan is zo werkend.